Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to the Quarantine Film Series. I'm your host, Kabir Segel, coming to you live from the ATL, from Atlanta. We are back. You know, we did so many of these episodes, and we went on a hiatus, and I got so many messages saying, where did you go? I didn't go anywhere. I was just here, hunkered down, quarantine. Um, but we thought we should bring the show back because, um, you know, the world has not resumed entirely to its scheduled programming. And we started the series back in March, as you may recall, because a lot of musicians and creative individuals had their concerts and gigs canceled. And uh, we also, you know, the film festivals were canceled, too. So it's been tough for creative in individuals to get their works out there to, to get the spotlight that they so deserve. So this is obviously a platform to support those in the creative economy. And, uh, you know, we want you to to support anyone you find on this broadcast, but going to their websites, checking out their streaming links and so forth. So we're going to continue the quarantine film series. We may settle on a particular cadence, a particular time and date, but for now, stay tuned on my social media. And uh, thanks for watching us on the reruns too. We really appreciate all the support and all the love you give to the filmmakers on this broadcast. This is a very special episode. We have an incredible maestra on the episode today. Uh, she's a remarkable filmmaker. Remarkable filmmaker. You may be familiar with her work. Um, she's worked on incredible feature documentaries such as After Innocence, which won the Sundance Grand Jury Prize in 2005. She's been nominated for an Academy Award for Sing, wonderful music documentary. We love anything music here. Um, and she's worked on some remarkable commercial work. She was hand selected, hand picked by Steve Jobs on one of her her, her short films as well. So. We want to welcome to the broadcast the remarkable, capable, talented filmmaker, auteur Jessica Sanders. Welcome. Thanks, Kavir. What an intro. Yeah. <laughs> Good way yeah. to start Saturday morning. I appreciate it. And thanks so much I, for supporting filmmakers. Like our, our pleasure. Our pleasure. I want to ask you first, um, how has the quarantine affected you? What do you have lined up that's been canceled or postponed? Um, and how have you been dealing with the quarantine? Uh, well, I was on set on March 14th uh, about to shoot a martial arts action short film that I'd been prepping. And it was like that one day where it was just everything had suddenly collided. So we actually, I just sent everyone home because everyone was freaking out about this crazy thing called COVID. Um, but I've actually had a really like positive and creative quarantine unexpectedly. And just, I feel like it's a good time to like the whole essential thing of just kind of getting rid of distractions and looking uh, within and kind of like reconnecting with like even my childhood self and things that I've like been passionate about as a kid and um, actually like started writing a script that I hadn't looked at for nine years and I'm almost done with that and um, just a lot of actually really amazing things have happened during this time so I actually think it's been really positive. Yeah do you have a um, particular schedule or routine in quarantine um, do you go for a walk? Uh, do you like take a left foot first out of the door? Like what are some idiosyncrasies or whatever that you've, you've picked up on? Cause people structure the days. Maybe there's no structure to your day. How do you get through your typical day? Uh, well, as an independent filmmaker, I don't, I mean, except for like getting to go to restaurants and coffee shops or places to go work. I don't except if I'm shooting it's actually not significantly different in terms of being creative and finding time and space for that. So I actually always organize my day about exercise first. So at the top of quarantine, I was walking eight to 10 miles a day to like, get myself through the quarantine. So for me, it's all like very connected, the whole like being balanced and healthy and, you know, like, and it translates to my work. So definitely exercise, eating well, never cooked so much in my life. And then within that, um, just, yeah, carving out kind of chunks of creative time. So yeah. Jennifer here wants to ask you, what kind of shoes do you wear on those long walks? Um, I totally have a quarantine injury too, because <laughs> I like, walk too much and hurt my back. But um, it's funny, I was in the director's guild, like this orientation thing and Paris Barkley, who is the president of the DGA, they had a whole thing about shoes because like directors are on our feet, you know, for, you know, 15 hours a day. And I didn't know that like, I think it was like Spielberg that changes his shoes at lunchtime. So, but apparently Hoka's are the, are the director's shoes of choice. They're really kind of like, you know, fluffy. So I have some Hoka's, so that I, I recommend those for long walks. See, these are the inside tips you get here on the quarantine series. Cool. Um, you have such an incredible background. Tell me about how you got your start in 
in filmmaking and the influence maybe your family had on on, on you growing up? Yeah, um, thanks. Yeah, I have definitely a diverse filmmaking background. My parents are both directors, they're both documentary filmmakers. So I grew up with amazing, you know, mentors and role models. My mom is the first Asian American uh, woman to win an Oscar. Um, wait, I'm looking at myself. <laughs> um, and we are two. We are two. Um, my dad was one of the founders of Keller Arts Film School. So I grew up in like a, my sister's an artist. Uh, my grandmother was an artist, made one film that was actually nominated for an Oscar. So um, and my parents have won two Oscars as documentary filmmakers. So I grew up in like a, you know, a hardcore documentary family and, you know, family vacations to like, for instance, Vietnam are actually research for their documentary on uh, fighter pilots who were shot down in North Vietnam or um, just kind of art and life is very interconnected and the subjects of their films are very much like part of my growing up. So I think, you know, growing up in LA, there's a lot of filmmaking kids of, but I think cause I grew up in documentaries, it didn't feel like Hollywood. It was really different. And also as a kid, documentaries weren't as cool maybe as they are now, even though I thought my parents were cool. Um, but I think, having filmmaker parents, it just, it's like, you know, I knew the sound recordist and the cinematographer is like intimately in the editor. So it kind of didn't make it, it kind of took the kind of mystique of filmmaking away and you understood like just the hard work and dedication and passion that it takes to create something. And then they're just, my parents are very, very supportive and they mentor a lot of people and teach. And um, so I'm, I feel very lucky to have them as my, yeah. as my parents and mentors. So. They're lucky to have you, blessed to have you in their in their lives. Um, your first uh, documentary feature, talk to me about After Innocence. Why was it, why did that story really speak to you? Because, you know, any of these projects, you, through years of your life, you, you invest in, in all these projects. So why was it this topic that spoke to you so deeply? Um, at the time, I was actually working on a documentary series following prosecutors, prosecuting criminal trials. And I'd been nominated for an Oscar for a short doc with my mom, the one saying that you mentioned. And... Um, my best friend's sister's friend was an attorney, a student attorney at the Innocence Project. So he'd heard about me. And so he reached out um, as me being the filmmaker, him being the kind of connection to the Innocence Project, where he, you know, was one of the many student interns that would open letters and, you know, they get thousands of letters from people in prison who say they're innocent. And it's the first, it's the only place that used use DNA to prove innocence. And so at the time, I just, I, hadn't thought about what it was like to be innocent because it um, it just ha wasn't a story that had been told. We made the film, we started the film in 2003 and the film came out in 2005. So we felt that we could really create change and awareness with this film. And the film ended up winning Sundance. It, you know, it, it came out 15 years ago, but it still is being used in law schools, police academies. It helped one exonerating the film get compensated for uh, after 22 years in prison for rape he didn't do. It's, it's, helped part like uh, change compensation laws. So it's been part of a big dialogue for change. And now like um, there's serial and making a murder and there's a lot of stories about wrongful conviction. But at the time we were like kind of the first big major film about this subject. So, um, that, but it was that, really out of wanting to like create change and help people. Yeah, this was so amazing about it. It almost seems like you were a trailblazer because we hear so much about criminal justice reform and just mercy. There's um, the Innocence Project that's that uh, focuses on this issue. And you were, at, to your credit, you were 15 years ahead of this um, and really making change. It's been amazing to see the ripple effects of the project um, as it's come out there. Um, is there a, um, do you do you keep up with anyone? Like, do you have your team that you sort of bring to your, your other projects or do you, is it always, I'm, I know there's always different people, but do you have like your your squad essentially <laughs> that you've you've gathered over the many years of creating films? Um, I mean, definitely, even from the people in the film. So for instance, uh, I met Jennifer Thompson and Ronald Cotton. Uh, Jennifer was a white woman who was raped in college in North Carolina. Um, and she, in a lineup, identified a man named Ronald Cotton as her rapist. And he was sentenced to life in prison and exonerated after 11 years. Anyways, they're in do After Innocence. Now I'm making a feature, my first fiction feature story, and it's uh, based on their story. So yes, I maintain these relationships. I'm very, you know, it's like my heart and I feel very connected to the people in my films. But then, yeah, like my cinematographer, Shauna Hagen on After Innocence shot my first student film on 16 millimeter film at Wesleyan. She shot my last documentary, um, March the Living. That was like a Holocaust international film. 
But I also, yeah, I became a commercial director and like I said, I'm moving into more narrative work. So I always like meeting new people too. So I kind yeah, of totally. kind of crew up per project and the project needs. And um, but yeah, I definitely have long relationships with everybody that I work with. And you know, I, I yeah. maybe being a, in a family of filmmakers, like it's not just a job. It's like you know, it's very personal. I think too. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've got to ask about saying I'm a musician and music producer, as you may know. And so I wanted to ask about um, the music and what what was it like um, putting that together? And maybe you could talk about some of the the uh, talk about. We'll describe the film for people for those who don't who don't know about it. But it's very cool to see the type of people and the type of music, the orchestral, the operatic music that you had is one of the focuses of this film. Yeah. So the Los Angeles Children's Choir is one of the best children's choirs in the world are based in Los Angeles. It's a community choir. Um, my That film actually produced and my mom directed, but we've made like seven films with this choir. And it's just really also about the importance of art in I think all of our lives, but especially in young people. And especially in a time when like there are less arts programs and education opportunities um, in schools. We just, it's this choir is like the highest level of kind of musical excellence and that kids can you know, learn to read music at a very high level, like, you know, you said orchestral, very, like, you know, a lot of choral history. And actually, uh, Billie Eilish, if you know her, she's like a huge pop star. She actually came up in this choir. Um, so it's an incredible, like, the training that these kids get is, you know, the best. Yeah, that might be worth another film project. Well, really? my mom has a new film called The Choir and the Connector that's coming out about the choir and Billie's in it as well. Oh, uh, cool. Yeah. So you guys are already already on it. Uh, yeah. Roberta, Roberta is asking about your love for music. She wants to know what music do you listen to when you go on your long walks? Your walks seem to be yeah. very, very popular here. <laughs> I know. I used to be like a dorky rollerblader. And that was like, I would listen and like get ideas. But I definitely don't rollerblade anymore. But um, yeah, I have a lot of musical advisors in my life. Just people that I love who give me music and mixes. And um, so I just, I have like, I listen to like kind of a little bit of everything. And also a lot of like, older music a lot of um like recently i love the new Haim album um i just a lot of like female musicians as well but um oh fiona apple i loved her new album that came out in quarantine yeah just like there's been a lot of ex amazing music that's come out at this time but um but music is really important to all of my projects and even like you know end of the line or any of my scripts i one of my uh collaborators is andrew khan who's a music supervisor and i start getting mixtapes that we start building for the vibe of whatever film I'm doing, like years in advance of the project, just mm -hmm. thinking about inspiration. Um, like my last film, End of the Line, um, we were inspired by Moondog. I don't know if you know him. He's like a yeah. blind, I think he's German. Yeah, jazz musician. So yeah, just kind of. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. The inspirations, yeah. So if you have any uh, things you want to share, could be remote. Yeah, I might do. Well, for those of you watching at home, before you go on your long walk, Get it, wear the special shoes and then check in with your music advisors to see what you should listen to. I think it's cool that you have some. That's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. Um, I do want to ask about this is I didn't I didn't know this about you, but I learned it about you. Um, the Sony make believe campaign. Um, what was it like to be handpicked by Steve Jobs? That was super crazy. So I was a documentary filmmaker and there is this campaign called Make Dot Believe about creative people who use Sony products to turn their ideas into reality. And so my dad is like diehard Sony person. And I would always like ask my dad if I could use his cameras and he wouldn't let me touch his cameras because he's really like hardcore about not letting one like futz with his settings. But then I would get his old cameras. So like our, my story was very like actually authentic to Sony. So um, I made this, you know, short film for, it's a 90 second short shot in my parents' house about growing up with film in our refrigerator and having like film stock and tapes under their bed. And it's kind of a little Valentine and thank you to my parents. And it ended up going, and it was made for no money. It ended up going viral um, at one can best new director and Steve Jobs ended up seeing it. I was brought in to do a test for this new product that he had called the iPad. I ended up doing something that he loved. And then I ended up winning the iPad launch campaign as my first commercial, which launched my commercial career. So it was not your normal. It's really hard to get into the commercial world. And it's also very male and Caucasian and straight too. So there's just, now there's, you know, more women and it just, but it's, it's still pretty um, imbalanced. So 
it's hard to, to get into it, but it's a great world once you're in it. So I'm really grateful for how that transpired. Yeah. It, it was a crazy experience. It was not your normal entree to like normally in commercials, you write a treatment and like, I didn't have any commercials on my reel. I didn't write and I just did something that he ended up liking. So it was yeah. not your normal land. Isaac and Bethesda Maryland wants to know just on that topic, what advice do you have for someone who wants to crack into the commercial world? Um, I'm on the board of something called the commercial directing diversity program with the DGA. So any women and diverse voices who are interested, but even if you're not, it's just like a good resource. So I would check that out. Um, let me think, I guess I look at a lot of reels of other commercial directors and like kind of analyze like, Oh, what spots do they have on the reel to get to this spot? Um, you know, shooting short spec content, um, like my little Sony film, like I mentioned it, that was, you know, it, that got me my, all my commercials, um, at the time, but, uh, you just need to start building little pieces, um, and, and just educate yourself about the commercial world. Cause like documentaries is its own little world. I'll obviously like narrative filmmaking TV is our own world. Commercial is also like its own separate world. So kind of, you have to kind of educate yourself about each, um, each world. Got it. Got it. Got it. I do want to ask you about, um, your narrative short film end of the line. Talk to me about, about that project. Um, and this underlying story by Amy Bender. Um, that's the coolest thing I've ever made. I read Amy Bender's surrealist short story in 2005 about a lonely man who goes to the pet store and buys a two inch man in a cage and brings him home and explores the abuse of power and is really wild and dark. Um, but I, it's not like a cheap short film to make with all the visual effects. You have to make a two inch man. We had 67 visual effect shots. Um, so I worked with a writer we named Joanne Geiger. We adapted the script, I don't know, like six years ago. I didn't even know how I'd make it. I was just like, I need to make this. <laughs> and then I ended up meeting um, uh, Refinery29. I don't know if you're familiar with them and the amazing women behind Refinery29, Shannon Gibson. Um, and they had a program called Shatterbox where they were giving like real money to female directors to make shorts. So this is, you know, like not a cheap short, but they really supported it and realized this amazing creative dream come true. And um, it premiered at Sundance, like 80 plus festivals on TNT, won a ton of awards. And it was the most visually exciting project I've ever made. And I, I loved like kind of big world building and large set builds. We built a 30 foot penis, a 25 foot cage. Um, my VFX supervisor worked on Star Wars. So we have like the same quality visual effects as any major uh, feature film. Right, right, right. Um, the post-production for this, how did you edit? Who edited? What was that? Where did you edit? Um, talk to me about the post-production because it seems a lot of this, the magic was made, was made yeah. there with the special effects. It wasn't even just that. It was, I had never done VFX before. So I just made sure that I surrounded myself with amazing teammates that could help me. So actually prepped the job, you know, it's a short, but we prepped it for a year and a half. So I storyboarded the entire film. Um, I brought on my production designer, you know, we figured out like the plan of like, you know, anything that was a close up shot um, or medium close up shot, we shot on a, on the actual cage that we built or the penis. Um, anything that was a wide shot, we would make a plate and then we put in little man. So it's not just like a final like editorial thing. It really like starts deep in prep. Um, and then on set, we had like two screens and we'd like flip back between the green screen, the composited image on screen. It was like this, it was like, a, everything was like a math equation that took six hours of analysis to do one shot. It was very like brain challenging, but I learned a lot. And then by the time we got to editorial, um, one of my commercial editors, Steven Berger started it. And then Claudia Costello, who actually was like an editor on Black Panther and Fruitvale Station, she's amazing. Um, she like brought a lot of the emotion to the film and um, it was just a very intense, but fun collaboration with a lot of amazing people. Yeah. You've worked on so many um, projects, a range of styles and genres. Um, Samantha wants to know, how do you know which project to choose? Good question. <laughs> um, I just, if I'm like love something and I'm obsessed with it, I'll just, I just think like everything I do takes years or a lot of time. So I just think that you have to be, 
or I have to be really passionate about it. I can't make work that I don't love and don't believe in. That's what I've learned because <laughs> I've tried like once and I, it doesn't work for me. So um, if I love it, I'll figure it out. So um, like I said, end of the line, I read in 2005. I didn't shoot it until 2018. <laughs> so I just kind of stuck with it. I didn't know how to make it my new feature um, a movie called Drench that's based on a surrealist uh, book of uh, short stories that I also read in 2005 and I'll have the script ready, no, no, 2010, sorry, you know, nine, 10 years later, um, picking cotton, my feature, I met Jennifer and Ronald, who the story is based on in 2003. So just, I guess everything takes a while, um, which is I think why I like short form like commercials, because you can be creative and create and it doesn't take like decades <laughs> of your life or years of your life. Um, but yeah, I just look for, and also I, I like telling stories that we've never seen before and um, you know, I'm half Asian, half Chinese. So I also like to like tell stories of, you know, my pilot embrace is about an Iranian American woman from Oakland. Like I haven't seen that before. So that was really interesting to me. So just telling stories with people that we've never seen before. Is also, I'm yeah. Passionate. I have to ask one more thing about, um, end of, the, end of the line. Tell me about the music and the soundtrack, uh, for that project. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, like again, I mentioned Moondog was an inspiration and, Pedro Bronfman, my composer is Brazilian. I made uh, this Brazilian Holocaust movie called March the Living and he did the music for that. And it was actually his choice to the entire score of End of the Line is saxophone. There's only one instrument, which I thought was really a brilliant choice and really unexpected. And it gives like a really specific vibe to the short. Um, so yeah, that was just, again, like bring on the the right creative teammates for each project. And then, you know, that was his idea. Um, so we went with it. Yeah, very cool, very cool. You have a new um, project in the mix. You always have a new project in the mix, which is awesome. Um, Picking Cotton, true story of Jennifer Thompson. Uh, maybe share what was, why did you get attracted to this story and where you are in the process with this particular project? Sure, um, yeah, so the story of Jennifer Thompson and Ronald Cotton, um, they are, kind of both sides of a wrongful conviction story, which I've never seen before. I feel like there's more like a Shawshank Redemption or kind of the the wrongfully convicted side, but this is the first story about both, you know, they're both victims in different ways. She was, um, she was a rape survivor and he was identified by her um, in a lineup. And um, I love this story and why I included them in my documentary is that they're now friends um, and they're also activists. And also Ronald solved his own case when he was in prison. He was in prison with the actual rapist. So it's just also like an incredible story. Um, but I, I just feel like there's not that many films about like the human story of just like connecting with another person that you have a, like they have an understanding and um, they were able to connect and create kind of good out of this tragedy. Um, so lineups are banned in a lot of states because of this case, because they actually promote like someone to pick an innocent person because the real rapist was never in the lineup, but Jennifer chose the closest looking person to her memory. It's a big story about memory, how unreliable memory is. Um, and Jennifer is now like starting an organization all about, you know, bringing together, uh, it's called restorative justice, like bringing together both sides of a crime for healing. Um, so I just, especially now in our country where there's so much divisiveness, I really think stories about healing and connection and communication is just, are really important in healing. So um, that's why I'm passionate about it. And it involves like race, class, gender. There's a lot in this story. So I like really rich stories. Where are you with this project? Like, is, um, it, is it done? Is it gonna, where are you in the process? Yeah, no, I'm an exciting point. Uh, I have my two lead casts attached who are amazing. Um, and we are just out for financing right now. And I've got um, Stephanie Lane, who's a great producer attached. So I have, I'm in an exciting place and it just, we're you know, assembling the financing right now. And then as soon as it's safe to shoot with COVID, like we'll go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, about that, Vanessa's asking on the financing part of it, what advice do you have on, on financing films? I, <laughs> I know it's, it can always be a hustle, but what, what advice do you have on raising money for your film projects? Um, how, do you, how do you do it? Good question. I mean, before this movie, my docs and narrative stuff has been financed through anything from grants to private individuals to Brazil actually financed March the Living through like this Brazilian tax cuts, which I didn't know 
was a thing, but my producer hooked that up. So there, I feel like it's kind of any, anything goes. So like for picking cotton, I've actually won a couple grants um, to develop it because it's taken six and a half years to get to this point. Um, but now I'm at an agency and so I'm, you know, being supported by them and they are going out with the script. So, but I think it kind of, you know, obviously depends on the budget and there's so many different wild ways to finance your projects. So. Yeah. Well said. Um, you have such an eclectic and fascinating background and career and you really are, um, a magician creating amazing stories, bringing books and stories and to life. It's great to see what you have, um, what you've already put out there. Your, your work, your like body of work is really remarkable. So I encourage everyone to check out Jessica's website. Let's get that up on the screen. JessicaSandersFilm.com. You'll see the whole, um, well, the portfolio, all what you can share on the website. And uh, is there anything else you want to uh, share with us? Any future projects you want to um, tantalize the audience with? Um, well, embrace the pilot that I directed one South by Southwest. So look out for that. Hopefully it'll be, you know, in the spirit of like Rami on Hulu or um, Atlanta um, on FX. So we're about to go uh, sell that show. So yeah, look out for embrace. It's about professional hugging. And I think especially now in a time where we can't be so connected, hugging, hugging and human connection is really important. What is professional hugging? <laughs> um, it's an actual profession. <laughs> okay. Um, I guess you can charge up to hundred dollars an hour, but yeah, people like will hire there. It's like professional cuddling. So, um, my, my project, uh, explores this young woman and her kind of entree into, into this new world of hugging. (laughs) In order to to save the family, because her mom, who's her family's from Iran and her mom loses her job and. Um, it's kind of like a side hustle in addition to going to med school, but yeah, it's, it's very unusual. <laughs> is this a, is this a, is there a big community of professional huggers? Um, I don't know if it's a big community, but there's like that woman, Ama, who's like the oh, yeah. hugging saint. So there's a whole hugging thing that you can like start digging into and like the power of hugs and even like the oxytocin that you get from human connection. So I think it's actually, yeah, I, I think it's probably going to be popular now, especially <laughs> after COVID. Yeah, I hear you. We need to get back to it. Yeah. Well, th- thank you, Jessica, for being a guest on the Quarantine Film Series. Um, you're welcome back anytime. We want to talk about your projects. So yeah. thanks for being here. I do want to um, thank everyone for watching and thank our wonderful producer, Shane. Shane, thanks for being the, being such a great producer. Um, check out Shane's uh, Spanish tortilla. He's a great chef. He also He's also really good at hummus. So if you're in his neck of the woods, hummus or Spanish tortilla, the Shane way. And that's it. That's it today. That's it for today. Um, keep it tuned here. We're all over the place on my social media. Thank you, especially for watching on their reruns too. And uh, we're going to try to settle on a cadence, as I mentioned. So uh, stay tuned for what day and time. But for now, we're going to kind of do these in an ad hoc manner. So thanks for watching the Quarantine Film Series. Stay safe out there. See you next time.